Monday afternoon, I had one of those conversations with an old friend, which I think we all hope not to have. He was two blocks away from the mass shooting in Louisville, Kentucky, when the guns went off. He heard everything. Thankfully, he was unharmed, but he was badly shaken. He knew the owner of the bank building, and the day's violence felt all too close. How many of you have had similar phone calls or worse? I know that some of you have lost loved ones due to gun violence, and others of you have been victims of gun violence yourself. All of us have been traumatized by it, I know that every time I learn of another shooting or hear of another tragic, unnecessary death, something in me goes a little bit numb. One of the tasks of the prophetic religious community is to pull us out of our numbness, our malaise. A congregation like ours should be a place for comfort, yes should be a place of joy and celebration, yes, but it also should be a community where we challenge each other to understand that things that we have come to accept as normal, almost 5,000, excuse me, almost 50,000 deaths a year from gun violence, school shootings, math shootings, lockdowns, safety drills, are abnormal. It is to recall and live into the words of Martin Luther King Jr. He said, there are some things in our social system to which I am proud to be maladjusted, and to which I suggest you ought to be maladjusted too. We should not be adjusted to gun violence. We should not think that it is normal. We should be maladjusted to it. We should never come to accept that it is normal to live with the fear that any of us at any time and in any place might perish at the barrel of a gun. Some of you might recall that a few years ago after the mass shooting at the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh, I preached a sermon in which I warned that the United States was becoming a totalitarian state ruled by a neo-Confederate regime. Now here in Texas, where the politics of cruelty reign supreme, we are all too familiar with the neo-Confederacy. A visit to the state capitol in Austin can easily lead to confusion about which side won the Civil War or why the war was fought. And don't get me started on the ways in which so many states' policies like the refusal to expand Medicaid are obviously rooted in some sort of commitment to white supremacy. But I suspect that many of us are a little bit less familiar with the nature of totalitarianism. The word gets tossed around in public discourse. People of all political persuasions proclaim it, or disclaim it. I worry that its widespread use has evacuated it of its meaning. Totalitarian societies are based upon fear. In them, no one is ever secure. The threat of arbitrary violence haunts every waking. People who live in such a society never know when or where violence will erupt. They only know that regardless of who they are or what they have done, they may meet a terrible end. The philosopher Hannah Arendt told us, in a totalitarian society, nobody can ever be free of fear. Terror, she warns, strikes without preliminary provocation. Its victims, objectively innocent, are chosen regardless of what they may or may not have done. Do her words evoke something that seems familiar to you? 
I know people who are hesitant to go to public spaces or send their children to school or come to sanctuaries like this one because they are afraid of the potential for gun violence. Certainly, for me, Arendt's statement reflects what it is like to live in a country beset by an epidemic of gun violence. What it's like to live someplace where, as the poet LaSalle Mueller feverishly wrote, where each haunted, someone who does not know you, somewhere is cleaning a rifle, carefully weighing the bullets. Yesterday, in recognition of the awful moment that this country has come to, and in hope that something might be done about it, we held a day of mourning for the victims of gun violence. If you did not make it, you might have seen something about it on Fox 26 last night. In a service timed to coincide with the National Rifle Association's annual convention, we honored the dead from gun violence here in Harris County. We heard testimonies from survivors and, in one instance, a former perpetrator of gun violence. Representative Ron Reynolds and community leaders shared words of compassion and encouragement. Religious leaders offered prayers. Reverend Scott, Chelsea, and a guest musician provided us with musical meditation. Sarah Sotov provided a performative one. Leslie Morrison and Denise Whitney did an outstanding job of organizing participants. But mostly we sat, sometimes in silence, and more often listening to the names of the dead, feeling the weight of our society's awfulness and hoping to provide a place for healing and hope for those in need of it. It was a powerful experience. It caused me further to question why the epidemic of gun violence has become so normalized. Why do people seem resigned to living in a society shaped by the violence of its by the violence of totalitarianism? Why have we become so well adjusted to something to which we must be, should be maladjusted? As both a minister and a scholar of religion, it is my belief that one of the tasks of the prophetic religious community is to help us wake up to what is. During the Easter sermon I oft serve at season, I often remind you that the purpose of the prophetic religion is to cause us in, to experience the revelation of what is, as the old Gnostic text tells us. Inspired by the Hindu poet Miriabi's enjoyment, get up, stop sleeping. The days of a life are short. Jesus is teaching God is not God of the dead, but of the living. Jewish theologian Martin Buber's claim, all actual life is encounter. I call this waking up the resurrection of the living. I sometimes think about my understanding of this purpose of our communion when I hear politicians declaring their war on woke. Now, the observation is certainly not original to me, but the strange thing about people who declare themselves to be dedicated to the opposite of woke is that they seem to be implying that we should stay asleep. In religious terms, they appear to be calling for us to stay living in a world of illusion instead of experiencing the revelation of what is. The revelation of what is. It's not normal to live under the constant threat of gun violence. Gun violence is something we should be maladjusted to, not something we should think of as inevitable. I was reminded of the absurdity of this country's culture of gun violence last summer when my family and I went to Europe. I arrived in England right after another mass shooting had made the news. And when I got there, it was like this weight, this tension that I had been carrying with me suddenly fell away. You see, 
England has very different gun laws than the United States. You'll never see someone openly carrying a firearm on the subway or the bus. Few of the London police officers are even armed with more than a billy club. The number of firearms deaths or deaths by firearms is minuscule. In 2016, the most recent data I found available, 107 people in the United Kingdom died from firearms. That same year, almost 40,000 people in the United States died the same way. The United States is an absurd outlier when it comes to gun violence. No other country with an advanced economy is experiencing a similar epidemic. And it simply does not have to be this way. There is common sense gun legislation that can make a difference. We know that policies like closing background check loopholes, limiting access to assault we weapons and high capacity magazines, and funding violence intervention programs work. But we can cast a larger vision. As a prophetic religious community, as a community of faith, we are called to make a way out of no way. We are called to wake each other up and wake our whole society up to the absurdity of what, under which we live. We are called to unleash the imagination and dream a world free of gun violence into being. You probably recall that firearms are the leading cause of death of children and teens in Texas. You possibly know that bullets killed almost 5,000 people in this state last year. You might remember that women suffering from domestic violence are five times more likely to kill if they live in a house where there is a firearm. But do you know anything about the economic costs of gun violence? Now, I don't really want to go there. Every human life, as a survivor testified yesterday, is a infinite universe, a beautiful, unique experience of personality, love, and complexity. But we live in a market economy where most human interactions ends up somehow getting monetized, getting calculated into dollars and cents the dollars and cents of gun violence in the land of the Longhorns? $51.3 billion last year. $51.3 billion. Now, there are something like 2 million guns in the state of Texas, the most in any state, which is probably why we are number one in gun violence. So here's a totally ridiculous act of imagination. What if we demanded that our virulently pro-business lobby over in Austin sponsored a statewide gun buyback day, just as a matter of good business and economic sense? If the state government took that $51.3 billion in economic damage that cause, is caused by gun violence and bought back each and every gun in the state, for $2,000 we could get each of them off of the streets and out of the homes in this state. And then we could spend that $5.1 billion every year in the years to come on something actually useful like, I don't know, public education, or health care, or green energy, or the arts, or, well, really anything. Actually, maybe we could just have a financial windfall like they have in Alaska and be a, call it the gun-free financial windfall and give every citizen of the state $2,000 just for living in a gun-free society. Now, I realize I'm being a little bit ridiculous. That $51.3 billion doesn't come directly out of the state coffers. It's the aggregate cost of medical bills, lost quality of life, lost wages, lost lives, funeral expenses, police and emergency responses, court fees, and all the rest that comes from gun violence. 
the actual direct cost to the state is but a fraction of that 51.3 billion. But that does not mean we should not talk about the economic costs of gun violence, nor does that mean that we should fail to imagine a world without it. Martin King, after all, said I, he had a dream, one which we must admit has yet to be realized, not I have a finely balanced set of books. At the First Unitarian Universalist Society, or Church of Houston, we say that our vision is to widen Love Circle. We widen Love Circle by offering survivors of gun violence a place to mourn and to heal. We widen Love Circle by drawing more people into the circle of love. Drawing more people in, encouraging them to wake up and experience the resurrection of the living, to come to the truth that we are each members of the great family of all souls, demands that we offer bold hopes to the world. An end to gun violence is one of mine. What about you? Waking up to what is. I anticipate that many of you have been following the story of the three bold legislatures in Tennessee who held a protest on their state house floor recently. If you have, you likely know that two of them, young black men named Representative Justin Jones and Justin J. Peterson were expelled from the House for protesting against gun violence while the white supremacists who represent the state's majority in a blatant show of racism failed to expel the third lawmaker, Representative Gloria Johnson, who just happened to be white. You probably know that Representative Jones was reseated on Monday when the Nashville Metropolitan Council voted to reappoint him and that Representative Pearson was reseated on Wednesday when the Shelby County City Co or County Council made a similar vote. But you might not know that Representative Pearson preached on Easter at the First Unitarian Church of Memphis. His remarks are powerful and I urge you to go find them online. One line that he repeated often has come to me as I've been preparing for this sermon. He said over and over, the sermon has already pre been preached. Now he did this in part because he was the third preacher for the service that day. He followed both my friend Sam, who's the minister of the Unitarian Church in Memphis, and his own father, who's a Baptist minister. The sermon has already been preached. The thing he was saying was that the words that he had to give last Sunday were words that generations of preachers of love and justice have offered to their congregations before. The sermon has already been preached. His words were meant to be a reminder that we have been here before. We have struggled before and no matter how difficult the hour, there have been moments of victory, moments when human hands united in faith bend the arc of the universe just a little bit towards justice. The sermon has already been preached. He spoke out against the politics of cruelty in his state. He linked resurgent white supremacy to anti-blackness, to anti-LGBTQ, legislation and to the targeting of the trans community. He linked resurgent white supremacy to gun violence and the fright, frightening truth, though he did not use the words that we live in a society creeping towards totalitarianism. We live in a society where we might be victims of gun violence at any time. And we have the power to lessen that violence because since the sermon has already been preached, we already know what we are supposed to do, what we need to do. The sermon has already been preached. Our second reading this morning was from James Baldwin. Now, if you've been here for a little while, you know that Baldwin is a little bit like scripture to me. His words about the brutality of, that lies at the core of this country's racial order 
and the possibility of love to disrupt it are something that consistently challenge me to wake up to what is. The morning's text came from an essay he wrote while he was living in Europe. In it, he reflected on how his time away from the United States had given him a certain clarity of vision. The vision included an understanding of the ways in which so many people in this country are devoted to denying reality, are opposed to waking up to what is. He was writing specifically about the structures of white supremacy and how they've been maintained across time. But like most good scripture, his words can be reinterpreted to relate to the epidemic of gun violence. He told us, it is only now beginning to be born in on us that the American vision of the world is dangerously inaccurate and perfectly useless. It protects our moral high-mindedness at the terrible expense of weakening our grasp on reality. Moral high-mindedness, a devotion to the Second Amendment above all else for reasons that have little to do with weapons of self-defense and hunting. Moral high-mindedness, a strange choice on display at the NRA convention this weekend in Indiana to conflate guns with God. Moral high-mindedness, a belief that somehow the divine is found in the armed. And Baldwin goes on, People who shut their eyes to reality simply invite their own destruction. And anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead turns himself into a monster. Those are some words. Remaining in a state of innocence long after the innocence dead turns people into monsters. The sermon has already been preached. We already know the kinds of actions necessary to reduce gun violence. We can have radical acts of imagination and envision ending it. It is up to us to have the faith that a way can be made out of no way, that we, we might be filled with doubt. The situation might be desperate it might seem impossible to imagine a world in which phone calls like the one I had on Monday no longer exist. But there is another truth, a truth that King pointed to when he urged us to be maladjusted to the awfulness of the world. There is a better way. Together we can wake up to what is and do our part, no matter how rough the road, no matter how wary our feet, to bring a little more just love and justice into the world and lessen the amount of violence in it. That it might be so, I invite the congregation to say, Amen.